Okay, good morning. Well, afternoon for you, John. Um, for the listeners, I'm Laura Hum. I'm one of the Dialogue Doctor editors, and I'm here with John Howard today to uh, review and edit one of his pieces. Um, good afternoon, John. You want to tell us a little bit about yourself? Yeah, good afternoon, Laura. Hi. Um, yeah, my name's John Howard, and I'm based in Stafford in the UK. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, I'm fairly kind of new to the idea of writing. It, it's something that I've been interested in for a long time. Um, and a couple of years ago, I finally started dipping my toe into the water. Um, I've written a couple of first drafts on a, on a novel um, and on a space opera novella, uh, but I've yet to have anything published. So this is my first time getting a piece of work professionally edited. Excellent, excellent. Well, we're really honored that you chose us uh, as your first foray into professional editing. Um, our editing services focus really strongly on character voices, and that's what I want to focus on on your piece today. Um, so can you tell us and the listeners a little bit about what this piece is and how it fits into your larger body of work? Okay, so this is the second chapter um, in a space opera novella. It was originally uh, a project that I kind of started pantsing out um, and I got probably about two thirds of the way through and then went back and just did a little bit of uh, outlining just to clean up the story and hopefully uh, tighten up the structure a little bit. But basically um, the basic premise is it's set a thousand years into the future um, but not much has changed like life is you know is as normal um as it is now it's very it's very much a kind of a british humor um and there's lots of inspiration from shows like red dwarf kind of the main character is heavily influenced by lister so he's a kind of uh disaffected guy um he he drives well he kind of he flies a uh basically a delivery van. He is a delivery driver for the Amazon of the future. Um, and if you've any, if anybody's ever seen, the, there's a, an amazing film by a British director called Ken Loach called Sorry We Missed You, which is a kind of a real in-depth look at the, the kind of the dark side of the gig economy and, and how the delivery drivers uh, for, for companies like Amazon work. So part of the kind of the trials and tribulations that he goes through on a daily basis kind of echo out, echoed out through that um but then there's also another aspect where eventually he kind of you know he harbors dreams of like being a secret agent and being a spy and having lots of adventures and fighting space pirates so it's originally aimed to be a series which will kind of hopefully evolve his character over several books um the first one as i say is a 20k novella I'm not sure whether the rest of the series will be novellas or there'll be more standard length novels. You know, it's still very much up in the air at the moment, but that's the kind of the basic premise um, of the series and of the book. Wonderful. It sounds really exciting. Um, I have to be brutally honest and I do not understand British humor. Um, I try so hard. My spouse watches a lot of shows with a lot of British humor and I watch them and I, I don't know if something's lost in translation, but I have to say that as I was reading your um, your chapter here, that I was really invested in who your characters are. And I love the way you are describing your main character, Derek, about he's kind of an everyday Joe who has like these dreams of adventure and I can kind of see that through in his dialogue so what I want to do with you today is I want to find a way to like work that um humdrum every day and this like dreams of grandeur into his dialogue and into this story. Um, so again, I'm just, I'm so appreciative that you shared this with me um, and I'm really excited to jump into it. So I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen with you. Okay. Um, okay. Um, so now you should be able to see your document. <clears throat> Now it looks a little different than when you shared it with me. I went through and I color coded each of the characters 
lines. So we could see very clearly who was speaking when. Um, and to, to kind of let the readers know kind of where we left off. And I actually got to have a sneak peek of chapter one as well. John, you shared it with us in the Slack channel. Um, and Jeff gave you some feedback last week, which was really great. Um, so, so I kind of had an idea of where this picked up. Picked up. Um, but for those of you who are listening who haven't had a chance to read John's work, um, the main character, Derek, at the end of the last chapter, got stunned, um, was kind of surprise attacked on his own ship. Um, is that accurate, John? Yeah. Yeah, excellent. So we start this chapter with um, Derek waking up. Now, um, John, you've got this written in first person voice, which is really great. It, it's a nice it's a nice way for the story to unfold here. Um, how do you expect your readers to engage with that first person voice? Is this like, um, is this like Derek telling us and recounting the story and then we kind of go into flashbacks or is this intended to be like real time, we're hearing what he's thinking? It's a great question. I think, to be fair, at, at different times, I, I kind of envisage that it's almost he is kind of recounting his tales, if you like. These are a series of memoirs throughout his life. Um, but I kind of see Derek as he's the narrator, almost almost breaking the fourth wall to a certain degree. You mm -hmm. know, he's kind of like the, the narration is his thoughts, uh, and what's kind of going on. So we're, we're hopefully seeing the story through his perspective. So it is almost kind of real time as well. So I think, yeah, there might be a bit of a disconnect there between the two styles, which I'll probably have to pick up at some mm -hmm. point. Yeah, so that it's really helpful for me to hear that from you because I kind of saw that in the first two paragraphs. So the first paragraph is that breaking of the wall, right? Where it's like, this wasn't the worst thing to happen to me, but it was definitely in the top 10 of the recent, right? <clears throat> Which is great from Derek's voice, but then you jump into the story with I woke with a start. So from a reader's perspective, that was confusing to me to be put into this idea that I'm about to tell you the story and then I woke up. So my recommendation for you is if you're going to use both styles, which can absolutely work. Oh, sorry. Excuse me a second. Okay. Hush. Um, if you're going to use both styles, I would set up sort of like a formula so that your readers are expecting that the first and the last of the chapter and maybe once in the middle, you're going to have this element of storytelling to them so that once you get into the rest of the story, they're expecting it. Um, which means that when you start with this, I woke with a start, maybe start with something like an ellipse so that they know that we're picking up with the next part of the story. Or maybe you decide you don't want it with the main part of the story and you want it to be more in the narration part, but something that identifies the difference between when the narrator is talking to us and when the narrator is telling the story, just something visually. Now, in some instances, I might suggest that the narrator is in italics, but you're using italics for your Alice voice, so I would not use italics also for your narrator because that'll throw the reader off as well. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. So, all right, that really helps kind of orient me to what I was seeing here. Um, I like this, I woke with a start. Um, you'll notice throughout, uh, there are a couple of places throughout where I made a note in the margin about emotion. So we at the Dialogue Doctor talk a lot about voice modulation and about what happens when somebody's feeling emotion. So we pick up at the, at the, the start of this chapter with Derek waking up after being stunned. But you'll notice that I put Derek in green. For some reason, Derek's voice was green in my head. So he shows up as green on the page. I hope that's okay for you. No, it's fine. But you notice that 
he's waking with a start, but he doesn't actually speak for another like three paragraphs. So if we think about what happens when we we're startled, we have this like guttural response. So my recommendation would be you take something like the who the hell are you or probably I would recommend the what's going on and I would put that right up here. So it's really quickly we know right? So it's, it's that emotion. We're pulling that reader in immediately once we hear this. Um, and then with the sitting up too quickly, so maybe I'm actually, I put it in the wrong place. I'm going to move this again. So I woke with a start, what's going on, and sat up too quickly, a bit too quickly. And then I would add an oof or an ow. Yeah. Um, as I hit my head on the, the bunk. So we're feeling that what's happening with him real time, right? And then you give us a lot of information in here about this was my childhood bunk, um, you know, that, that sort of thing, which works. But if you keep me in the moment by having this other person that we don't know say something back, before we realize where he is, that gives us this opportunity. I'm sorry, I should be tracking changes instead of just making them live. No, that's fine. I mean, that what you're saying there makes perfect sense because he woke with a start, what's going on? And then, ow, I suppose is that that gives a good lead in as to why Maiden is then saying sorry. Exactly, exactly. We're, we, we've, we're now orienting the reader to what's happening then it allows for that dialogue to go back and forth and back and forth. Um, so then you've got, again, the narrator here talking to us. Did I mention she was naked? Um, you know, I'm, I'm getting fat shamed. All of this is really fun and great, but, you're, but you have the narrator directing it to us as the reader instead of allowing it to be Derek's like thought process in the moment. So she says that she's sorry, it's the closest bed she could find. Maybe then we put the fact that, you know, I, I realize I'm in, um, ooh, that is not how I wanted that to go, sorry. So then we take some of this information about I'm in the bottom bunk, um, and then maybe it's the, um, the element about I'm being fat shamed um, by a beautiful naked woman, right? Like this becomes his inner thought. So then this element of, did I mention she was naked kind of pulls me out of that moment because now I'm not recounting the story, I'm talking to you. So this is something that I might consider removing just to keep us kind of staying right there in the moment. Um, it's so finding that, that balance, as what you're saying, it's finding that balance between the description and his thought process. Exactly, exactly, yeah. So, and that's where, you know, it's fun for us to hear what's going on in our characters' heads. We really like that, especially in a story that's first person, but we have to be careful of who, where we are in the story. Are we being talked to or are we like in the moment with Derek? And I think in this situation, because you have this really high stress situation where he's waking up and he's a little bit scared, um, we want to really lean into the fact that he's recounting what it felt like and put that wall back up between us as it were. Okay. Um, so then you'll. this is one of those places where I I added the emotion element. So in this thread, he goes very quickly from this panicked, who the hell are you? Why are you naked? Into this kind of feels a little bit like a joke of you're not going to do things to me, are you? Right? So what you could actually do is who the hell are you? Why are you naked? 
um, and then get into this part about who I am and then come back to this, right? Like, but why are you naked, right? So then the story comes out and then she has this line about, um, where is it? You have a line about why she's naked. It, it comes later um, when they're walking to the cabin. She talks about how um, her people aren't shamed they don't see need, they don't see a need for clothes that feels like it needs to come up because Derek is really obsessed with the fact that this beautiful woman is naked in front of him and fat yeah. shaming him right like so we want to make sure that we're pulling all of those answers to all of those questions that the readers are asking we want those answers early on before Derek shifts to the fact that why is she here right like we think about the fact that this is our ship. We're not expecting anybody else. We wake up after being stunned. We hit our head. Where am I? Who are you? Why are you here? And oh, by the way, why are you naked? Right? Like these are the questions we want the reader to unfold with us because we don't want to leave too many of these questions early on in the story. As a, you know, as a writer, we can always use the leave a question open for the reader, but we have to be strategic about those questions that we leave open for the reader because we want the reader to have enough information to feel really engaged in the story and feel like this is what I would do or this is how I would feel if I woke up here. These are the things that are going to be important to me. The other things can happen a little bit later. So I would just recommend a little bit of reorganization of this section to keep us in the moment and keep that dialogue flowing. Now, I want to talk about this section in here about who am I? I'm Maiden, Iron Maiden, no, I'm Maiden, right? Like that is brilliant, I think. So maybe I do understand British humor. Who knows? <laughs> I thought this was a really good um a good way of like kind of breaking the tension between these two characters. But we want the reader to understand why Derek is confused when Maiden says, I am Maiden. So what I might recommend we do is make a change to this. And it's a little bit weird. You, you really can't see the line because I'm sharing the changes. So I'm going to edit them. So for those of you who are listening along and can't see on the screen, John has the line, I am maiden, all written out in separate words. And I'm actually suggesting that he write it all as one word, removing the spaces. So it looks as though it's gibberish to the reader, which makes us as Derek hear it as one word, as opposed to hearing it as I am maiden, which means that when he comes back and says, Iron Maiden, is that some kind of threat or promise, right? Like it makes sense to us that this is what's happening. Like, where did that confusion come in? So then when we get down to her line where she's responding, no, I am maiden, it's my name in your tongue, I would actually, I would um, separate it out to say, no, period, I am space, 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 or ellipse, maiden. So it's the fact that she's emphasizing and she's articulating the words show up in the dialogue before you use the dialogue tag, she said, articulating the words slowly, right? So it's like this idea that, or maybe it's not an ellipse here, maybe it's a period and then a period after made it, right? So we're seeing that slow articulation. So this is a trick that we can use as writers to use punctuation in a way that we were taught not to use punctuation when we were learning like what a period is. You know, growing up, we always hear that a period is at the end of a sentence. Well, in dialogue, a period is simply telling the user that they need to do a full stop, right? You could also do it with a comma, but commas look weird here. And you could even, if you wanted to push it even further, 
you can throw the period after the I. So it's no period, I period, M period, maiden period. She articulated in words slowly, right? So it's just a trick that we can use as we're editing. Now, most of the time when we're writing, we don't want to stop to think what kind of punctuation and how do I edit this, this particular line to make it so that I'm showing the reader that I'm articulating the words rather than, right? Like this is something that I, I really recommend writers, especially um, writers who are just getting familiar with their characters' voices, do in an edit as opposed to doing live because it can slow you down as a writer until you get into the feel of who your character is. So my recommendation on this would be definitely to do it in another pass. So um, you with me so far? Is this all making sense? Yeah, yeah that all make, that makes perfect sense. I mean, just what I tend to do, I'm a, kind of probably a little weird in that most of my first drafting, I actually tend to do on my phone. Oh, that's great. So, yeah, so I, I use Scrivener on my phone. And uh -huh. um, I actually do, because so, I find it, I get that kind of stream of consciousness being able to just go through. And then yep. what I tend to do then is, is open the document in Scrivener for the desktop. And mm -hmm. then kind of, because the phone is great for just getting um, words out, but yep. then it's not so great for editing and moving blocks of text around. Sure. That's when I come back to the document in Scrivener to do that. Excellent. And I, I love that process. Um, we definitely encourage writers to figure out the process that works for them and to use that process and to embrace it, right? Like this is where we're talking about creating art. We're not talking about creating a formula, right? Like there are mechanics to art. There are mechanics to dialogue. There are things we can learn. But when you're writing and you feel, we joke in the Slack channel all the time about the muses, right? Like when the muses are speaking, we have to follow them. Or we try to, uh, somebody was talking about how they were trying to negotiate with their muse about like, no, we're going to do it this way now. And the muse is having nothing of it, right? Like, so I, I love that when you're writing, we don't want to break that flow when we're writing. So when you're writing on your phone, just keep doing what you're doing. This becomes an editing piece where we can go back and we can see, okay, we're going to slow this down. Let's add some periods in here. We want to make this more articulate. So let's change some of these words. This all happens in the editing side of things. So I, I would guess for you, it would be more at your desktop than on your phone. Yeah, absolutely. And, and to be honest, this was exactly the kind of uh, feedback that I was looking for, because it's easy for anybody just to pick up a phone and start writing and kind of read, you know, read through. But it, it's then that st structural analysis afterwards. And as you say, it's pulling out and finding the voice and structuring it so that you've got this kind of nice back and forth and, and it's balancing really well. Yep. Exactly. And that balancing, when we're talking about the dialogue doctor, that balancing we call pacing, um, just as, you know, for those of you who are kind of new to the channel and have heard these words of words, body language, cadence, and pacing, and you're like, what the heck are you talking about, about pacing? It's that back and forth and the flow between the characters. We call that pacing. Um, you all, as writers, can call it whatever you want. You can call it flow. You can call it back and forth. Um, but just so if you're using the, the Dialogue Doctor lexicon, um, we, we refer to that back and forth as pacing. Um, and what I like to talk about in the back and forth is how it moves your story along. When you want something quick and high emotion, like panic, which Derek is feeling, you want that pacing to come really, really quickly. So in this first part where we were talking about of what's going on, oof, sorry, this was the closest bed, I might stop it here and then add a, who the hell are you, which is your line from below. Maybe she doesn't answer and she says, I, I could, this was the um, closest bed I could find um, and you're kind of heavy. So maybe we just cut it out. So it's just the, you're kind of heavy. And then maybe he repeats, who the hell are you? Maybe we throw in a, why did you stun me? 
and why are you naked, right? And then you can pull in this, I am maiden, Iron Maiden? No, I am Maiden. That's my name, right? So now you've got the immediate intensity where the dialogue is flying back and forth really quickly. Now we get to the point, okay, she's sharing our name. We don't really have to be necessarily afraid of her, but we still have more questions to ask, right? So this allows us to just change the pacing, which changes the intensity for us as the reader. The faster the dialogue comes, the faster the reader is going through the emotions that the characters are feeling. When we start slowing the dialogue down by putting more language and prose between the dialogue, that's when it signals to the reader that they can relax a little bit. Now, um, reading is one of those things that we learn how to do when we're young and then most of us don't really think about what we do when we read it just becomes part of our nature unless we're a teacher and we're teaching other people how to read and then we think about the structure of reading all the time but most of the time as we're reading we're not thinking about what the dialogue means versus what the prose means. We're not reading this line that says, no, I am maiden. She articulated the word slowly that, so that she could work their way around the throbbing pain in my head. It's my name in your tongue, she added, right? Like, I'm not thinking about the fact that every single word in the no, I am maiden line is its own sentence. I'm just reading it and moving on. I'm not thinking about the fact that there are two sentences between her next line, but when I move into those two sentences of prose, I can kind of back up and think for a second and then the dialogue comes, so I lean in again. So these are tricks that we learn to manipulate our readers in the moment and manipulate them in their experiences, not manipulate them as like a negative, we're trying to take over the world in our manipulations. But um, it just gives us this, this moment with them to help them kind of understand what's happening. But as writers, we and editors, we have to understand what's happening for the reader when we're inside of quotation marks and we're outside of quotation marks. Jeff likes to talk about it as um, kind of a like a drone in a forest, right? Like when we're in the dialogue, we're right there in the forest with the, the reader. And then when we're in prose, we're pulling back and we're seeing the whole forest. Um, so that back and forth, the zooming in and zooming out, TV does it all the time, where when we want them to pay attention to something, we want them to focus, they zoom in really close. It's all we're doing with dialogue. As the story's being written in, at the moment from a first person's perspective, isn't that's also fairly close as well, isn't it, in terms of direct? So we're never actually pulling out that far. Correct. Um, the, the how far back we're pulling for me as a reader depends on what we're talking about. If it's this moment where um, not only did I get shot in my own cargo bay, but now I'm being fat shamed. That's keeping me right there in the moment. But a little bit later down here, where you start telling me about the ship's name, the ship's name. So if we think about it as how close we're zooming, if um, we take the tightest concentric circle, and that's the dialogue. And then the next part out is the dialogue tags that are helping us understand the dialogue. And then we go a little bit further out and we're talking about the prose related to the dialogue. And then we go a little bit further out. You're, you're now you know, four circles away from your inner circle of dialogue as you're telling me backstory. And the more backstory or how the further the backstory is to relate specifically to that element and that kernel of dialogue, the more I'm being pulled away from the emotion of the moment. So as writers, when we're going back and we're editing our work, we have to make a decision about how important are some of these background elements to the reader and to the story. So the fact that it's, you know, we're talking about the ship's name, and that he drunkenly put the ship's name down as the rust bucket. Um, it's really fun. It's it's a really good element that lets us know that this um, 
this everyday delivery driver has this really great sense of humor, even if it only shows up when he's drunk, right? So it it's an interesting um, element that we can put in there to give our readers some backstory. But if you were to, and you didn't do it here, but let's say in this section where you were talking about um, the delivery driver or the contracts and putting the ship's name down, right? If you had also talked about what the other person said, or are you sure you want that or how he got drunk, right? Like if you're putting in all these other details, all of those details are pulling me further and further away. So if, if you had done that, my recommendation in here probably would have been like cut all those things, keep the most important things that the ship's name is the, the Star Voyager. And that on some stuff, it says the rust bucket, right? So you did a really good job in this, in this section about finding the right balance between details and um, details that are important to the story for us as the reader and background information. So does that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. Just um, in terms of that paragraph, would mm -hmm. you, um, obviously it starts with Derek uh, answering the question, uh, yes, it is, mm -hmm. you know, when, when she asks, is she on the right ship? And yep. then he stands up and tries to kind of look semi-professional. Would you start a new paragraph where it says technically the ship's name is Star Voyager? Or... So that's a really great question about where you start paragraphs. For me, as a reader, if you have back and forth in dialogue, unless you're changing who is speaking, I would not start a new paragraph because when you're doing dialogue back and forth, if you start a new paragraph, even if it's just prose, and then somebody else is answering, then I'm, then I'm confused as to whose turn it is to speak. Now, if you're planning to put, er, yes, yes it is, I rolled out of bed, start with technically the ship's name is the Voyager, um, then I would say something like, she nodded. So it's her turn to speak. He finishes this with the technically blah, blah, blah. And then he needs another line before it's her turn to speak again. Um, so I might even do it this way. So she nodded um, or she nodded and looked relieved. Oh, sorry, that is not what I wanted to do. Yeah, because I think that sentence, technically the ship's name is, that's more, I feel, kind of narrating. Again, it's almost that fourth wall, isn't it? It's Derek yeah. talking to the reader rather than, you know, because he, he knows what the ship is. It's It was a vehicle to try and explain the ship's name is technically the Star Voyager, but everybody refers to it as the Rust Bucket. Yep. So you could even take that information and um, turn it around into dialogue. So maybe he says something like, er, um, don't be fooled by the, I don't know, rust bucket signs the crew made. I don't know. You, this obviously is me taking some gross editorial liberties, but like you can turn stuff that's background information into dialogue to bring us into the moment. And then you can leave the, technically the ship's name is this, a throwback to its earlier life, but I got drunk when I signed some contracts. And it and was joking when I put that right. Like you can put some of this information into dialogue. You don't have to, but keeping the back and forth for us as the reader, so whose turn it is to talk, allows us to stay in the flow because you've got you go directly back into this line 
where she's talking again. So we need to know it's her turn to talk, especially if we're going to leave out our dialogue tags. And lots of times when we're doing quick pacing, we can cut our dialogue tags completely, especially when we have two people in the scene because it's back and forth and back and forth. And again, it's one of those things that we as readers learn to do when you're, we're young and then forget that we even do it. And it's just my turn, your turn, my turn, your turn, my turn, your turn, because that's what happens in real life. So. Yeah, I do try and consciously remove the dialogue tags as much as possible, hoping that the, the context mm -hmm. and what they're saying um, indicates, you know, it makes it obvious. And again, in this instance, there's only two people here. Um, what you were saying previously about the back and forth and, and the in the first chapter, that there was a lot of kind of exposition. And part of the feedback I had there was was trying to break that up mm -hmm. to to try and turn it where possible into dialogue and banter between Derek and the ship's computer so that it wasn't just here's a here's a page of info dump because I'm going to tell you a load of stuff. Yep. Yep. And that's one of the things that a lot of writers get from Jeff and me consistently is that um, the big paragraphs of exposition take us out of the moment. So if we can find a way to give the reader that in backstory with a conversation, that works really great. And you've done a really great job in creating your characters in that you have given Derek someone to talk to all of the time, even if he's alone, because you've created this Alice character who is the ship's computer. So... Now that we've talked a little bit about flow, I want to take a ne the next few minutes and I want to talk about the voices of the characters that you've created. So for Derek, you mentioned that he's kind of the average everyday um, working person who has these ideas of grandeur. Um, and in this case, we start, we see him kind of started with the startled. Um, how do you see him and his personality? Um, do you see him more as like a strong commander um, who, who just has a boring job? Do you see him more as like a lackey who got put into a job and was never really given opportunities? Like, how do you kind of see him as he relates to the rest of the world that he's in okay i mean the way i kind of originally envisaged derek he's he's pretty much um a slacker he's the kind of the atypical 30 year old still living in his parents basement never left home spends his entire days playing video games except in this scenario you know the home is the spaceship and he never left home but everybody else left and he's the last one standing so he kind of like inherited the business as it were and he's just out to do the bare minimum he can just to kind of he has these dreams of grandeur but he's too lazy to basically get off his backside and do anything about it until you know circumstances are thrust upon him he meets maiden um there's obviously something going on here not between the two of them but there's mm -hmm. She's a um, she's on the run uh, from space pirates, so he ends up getting dragged into a scenario that um, you know he would obviously otherwise avoid, like the plague. And all of a sudden, you know, he decides for once to kind of to stand up and do something about it. Much further on, um, after a whole other lots of uh, you know events happen. Okay, that's excellent. I love that description of him. And I'm all in for reading a story about a slacker who has um, dreams of grandeur, but is too lazy to get there. Um, you, you've, got, you've got me in this character. I'm ready to read this story. Um, tell me more about Maiden. She's, you mentioned um, she's on the run from Space Pirates. Who was she before she jumped on the ship? Okay, so um maidens people are basically um they live or the aim is that they they live on a um in science fiction terms would be known as a kind of generation ship so like a colony ship that spends its entire life you know flying through the stars so they're kind of a bit of nomadic people and this is where if you imagine you've got kind of 
an entire colony of thousands of people living in close knit kind of community they you know there's no room for privacy as such you know that that's why they kind of they have no kind of body issues because rations are very scarce on the ship they tend to kind of uh, they have to make do um as they go along and they've learned to become they keep their cards very close to their chest so internally mm -hmm. they, they're very very private people because there is no privacy on board the ship um the the kind of the story is that um the ship uh is is dying or that the, the ship needs its extensive repairs so they've maiden and her grandfather have kind of reached out to a group of people looking for help and they're, lo they're looking for a home and are looking to get settled um however they were kind of like conned and double crossed and there's a whole plot to effectively enslave her people when she discovers it she basically takes all the evidence and goes on the run um and she's trying to um escape and get back to the authorities her people um which is why she ends up choosing the most the smallest you know a, a most um inconspicuous delivery firm that she can find um and there's an element in the kind of like later on where she tells Derek why she chose his ship because his surname dark spelt with an e kind of again it's symbolic in their kind of language terms that the dark is the night it's the protector it's where they feel safe so she kind of that's why she was drawn to him so there's a kind of like coincidence of the naming um but the whole purpose of the story and and going forwards is that Derek eventually kind of learns to become a much more authoritative and stand-up figure you know become the hero that he wants to be Maiden kind of is very naive and innocent because she's lived her entire life in this kind of like sheltered community so she's no so she's open to kind of experiencing life because at the end of the story um spoilers but you know they 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 go off together and not as a couple but as a team so there's definitely kind of elements of um kind of like almost guardians of the galaxy where the kind of the mm -hmm. team come together and throughout the story and, and what i think going throughout the, the, the series th there's going to be an emphasis on family so maiden has come from one family derek is looking for a family and together all these kind of characters get thrown together and th there will be other characters that get introduced mm -hmm. and i think there'll be about three or four of them ultimately on the ship that form a, a team in, in, in the loosest sense but they kind of band together almost as a dysfunctional family. Excellent. All right. So what I love about what I've heard you say is you've got two characters who are very polar opposites of each other. You've got Derek, who's a slacker, who wants to be a hero. And you've got Maiden, but has kind of traveled a lot because as a delivery person, he's been all over the galaxy. So he has a lot of like real galaxy knowledge. Maiden, who is somewhat naive, but has all of the gumption that needs to happen in order for her to be the hero. She just doesn't have the real galaxy experience to take this on. So you've, you've got a natural partnership in them, but you've also got a lot of opportunities for them to clash together because she only has like book knowledge of other places because she's lived in one close quarters where she's surrounded by people all the time. Derek, on the other hand, kind of lives by himself, is in his own world. So he doesn't really understand what it's like to share space. So you've got this really great opportunity for a lot of conflict uh, between your characters. Um, so as you're talking about Derek's voice, um, he's kind of lazy. He kind of inherited his business. So he probably has somewhat of a sense of entitlement. Is that fair? Um, possibly, yeah. I mean, I think it's almost a sense of not quite entitlement, but 
um, I'm trying to think of the word. Uh, he's kind of angry towards his family that they basically left him behind. So, you know, over the, this was a family business. Mm -hmm. Members of the family have died. Others have kind of moved away and he's basically been abandoned. So it's more, he feels abandoned by his family rather than kind of entitled. To okay. Business. All right. So maybe he has some trust issues because he thinks everybody's going to leave him. Is that fair? Uh, po possibly. Yeah. Okay. Um, I hadn't kind of really dug that deep into it, but okay. you know, there is um, in the second book the the, the which I'd kind of planned and I've started working on there's opportunities to reconnect with his family and, and in that point he you know he starts off very much I don't want to hear from them you know he's deleting mm -hmm. all the communications he's refusing to acknowledge them and Maiden is then basically saying to him look you know family is important you need to kind of like reconnect with your family you know because of obviously what's happened to her with her grandfather and what happens in the, this story. So it very much kind of continues that exploration into their character. Um, and that will end up with Derek kind of realizing that Maiden's the one he can trust. Maiden, you know, they mm -hmm. are a family together and they almost become like a brother and sister to a certain degree. Okay. Um, so he's kind of angry and he spends a lot of time alone, um, but he has kind of these dreams of what life could be. So as we're translating those elements of background into personality, into voice, um, we kind of can see him as um, pretty informal in his language. Um, because he doesn't talk, he doesn't have a lot of opportunities to talk to anybody except for a computer. So he can be informal. He can be a little bit gruff. Maybe he's a little bit rough around the edges when it comes to like the language he uses and the demands he makes of other people because he's not really used to having other people around and that residual anger. Um, that sound. That there's a, there is, there's an element of that. Um, but what the kind of the role that the computer plays and the AI is she's almost uh, she's basically like a nanny program so okay. she kind of the computer almost is his kind of nanny slash mother aspect so if he does try to curse or he does try to get a bit too gruff then she's the one basically taking him to task and pulling him back which okay. he kind of objects with and you know he tries if he tries too hard to exert his dominance the computer basically puts him back in his place okay so he kind of not bullied but he's kind of like held in check by the ai until eventually you know there's the turning point in the story where kind of derek strides forward and then all of a sudden the computer is like oh wow you've now grown into the man i always knew you could be Great. and gets behind him so there's a very there's a transition point later on in the story Okay, great. So maybe the direction that you want to go kind of as one of the modulations of Derek is he's kind of lazy, he's informal, he's grumbly, he tries to show his authority. But whenever he does any of these things, his nanny, who's Alice, kind of reprimands him and puts him back in his place, which kind of puts him back in that place of like grumbling as far as like doing the right thing and saying the right thing, even though he doesn't necessarily believe that it's the right thing until later in the story when he's kind of seeing the benefit of all the things that Alice has been trying to teach him. Is that fair? Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Um, so the reason that I'm spending so much time here with you talking about these things is these are going to translate into some of the changes that I'm going to recommend that you make in the voice of the character. So we talked about pacing and about how we wanted the back and forth, but now what we need to do is we need to figure out what words we want to choose for each one of these characters. But before we do that, I want to talk about Maiden just for a second. Um, so Maiden has lived her entire life um, in one place, in one situation. So when she's speaking, her language is going to be a little bit more formal than his, because he's not talking to anybody but a computer all day long. 
she's used to living in close quarters where she's talking to everybody. So her language is probably going to be formal, maybe a lot more cautious. Maybe she's slower to speak um, than he is because he can say anything he wants because the only person who's listening is the computer. If she speaks, 30 or 40 other people are hearing what she's saying, right? So it gives a nice juxtaposition to the language. So taking this difference between the informality of his language and the formality of her language, let's jump in here to the section where we're talking about um, the, this like, the body shunning and the, um, the like, why it's, this doesn't surprise me because you're walking around naked, right? Like this is a really great line. That's very Derek, the way you described him, right? Like he's, she's on his ship. She's already told him that she's looking for passage to Andor six. He knows that she's a customer. And yet here he is, he is like making fun of her because he doesn't understand the social graces. So her response is to go back into this really formal, my people have no need for body coverings. Maybe she even ends that with a period and changes that to we shun the idea. But I appreciate the need for stealth and adorned by traveling cloak whilst waiting for you to arrive, right? Like, so her even, I don't know if you were doing this intentionally or it's just how her voice sounds. Like he's, she's very formal. She speaks in very strong sentences, whereas he's kind of lazy in his wording and he's kind of like, you know, just laying it all out there. That really makes a fun juxtaposition between these two characters. Yeah, I mean, when I kind of originally was was thinking about Maiden and the kind of the situation and where she came from, the closest thing that I could use as kind of reference was that Maiden was almost like from an Amish community where they're so isolated. Yep. So she, she has that kind of very uh, different style of speaking to Derek. Yep. Uh, from Derek. And, and again, that kind of shows this kind of like, everything is about the community and her ship and everybody working together as a collective. It's that, um, you know, and that this kind of make do amend and there's nothing, you know, they, they've almost kind of frozen themselves with the technology that they have mm-hmm. and then they kind of reuse everything. So it, it was kind of definitely, there was an army, you know, there's definite Amish influence to Maiden and her kind mm-hmm. of like her people and her culture. Absolutely. Yeah. And you've done that. You've done a really nice job of pulling that out in her language and in the formality of what she's saying. Just my recommendation is that you watch that as you go through that she continues to have that formality, at least in the beginning scenes, while he kind of um goes backward into that like maybe he in some instances tries to match it and then messes up um one of the things i noticed that you did with his voice a lot is you use this er you use it as he's talking to her but then it drops in places something like an er or a verbal tick is something that if you're going to use it you want to use it really consistently. <clears throat> so anytime he's embarrassed or um, so like when he's demanding information, like you're on my ship, I, this makes sense to not have it. But like in this one where it's, I surprised you, I was, ex- you might want to throw an er in here as well. So I wasn't sure if the er was a verbal tick or if the er was a like showing nervousness. So just kind of think about when you're going to use something that's that strong and that consistent, really kind of think about what it means and how you want it to come across in your dialogue. Yeah, that one that you've got highlighted, uh, uh, your room isn't quite ready yet, that is that's supposed to be, it's a little bit of nervousness because obviously, you know, he's trying to be professional, but the only room on the ship is actually Derek's, effectively Derek's bedroom. 
Okay. And it's, and it's a tip. It's a tip. So he's kind of like he's showing embarrassment there. Okay. So if that's the case, then let's think about this line just a little bit differently instead of the er. Um, so let's change it to something like a, so um, your room. Well, it's not quite ready. I er, didn't have much notice. Yeah, because he's trying to think he's trying to think on his feet and make it up right. as he goes along. Right. So as I was reading it, the er felt like a verbal tick, which is why I wanted it in other places. If you're using it to show hesitation and nervousness, I would break it out differently instead of using the same one over and over because the same one over and over represents a verbal tick versus breaking it up. And sometimes he's using um, and sometimes he's using er, and sometimes he's using an ellipse. So this is a place where I would actually have him tell us as the reader, I'm going to have to put her in my quarters and explain that storyline that you were just telling me. Let's explain that so that we understand where his nervousness is coming from. So uh, you actually start to say it up here um, and along the corridor to the master suite. Over the years, the other staterooms had been ripped out for extra cargo space. And the only one left was the one I used. Okay. So this becomes really formal in here and along the corridor to the master suite, which is where is the one I use. Over the years, the other staterooms had been ripped out for extra cargo. So here's, here's the thing about something like this. Um, I didn't read any of that because it wasn't in quotation marks. And again, I'm an extreme case on this read on this read. Um, so yeah, so let me let me change this out here and what I'm doing. So thank you. I nodded, of course, right this way. I excused along the path to the master suite. Then she should say something. Um, perhaps it's this one. I understand my needs are so few. Oh, that's specifically to <coughs> the fact that um, it's not going to be. Yeah, the idea here is he opens the door, she sees a messy bedroom and right. says, oh, oh, don't worry about it. Don't worry. Derek thinks he's getting a reprieve. He gets to keep his bedroom. And then right. she says, like, I don't actually need anything, you know, so there's that little bit of back and forth where he he kind of he's embarrassed to show his bedroom mm -hmm. like a, effectively like a teenage boy um and then she says i oh, don't worry about it he thinks he's getting the room back and then she takes over the room again excusing the mess mm -hmm. and then derek so there's a kind of like high low high thing going on i hope yeah yeah that makes sense um Yeah, so if you do if you do it this way, so that he says, of course, right this way, she says something, maybe it's this, like, I will only need a moment to rest because you say up here, um, we, we should get on our way. So maybe she says something like, I'll, I'll only require a moment alone. Um, and then he can say, over the years, most of the staterooms have been um ripped out and then he can explain this to her and then she can say this i mean would it be possible to take the thank you where she she ends the sentence thank you and make that what she says so, brilliant exactly yep 
that's that's exactly the the answer right there yep see you got this you don't need me i'm glad you're using me but yeah <laughs> yeah so that's that back and forth um and what i really liked about what you did there is you took stuff that you had already written um sometimes it doesn't take new content it just is a matter of moving things around to give that back and forth to break up that prose so the one last thing that I want to talk about before we wrap up the session is Alice's voice. Um, so as you were describing Alice, you were talking about her as a nanny program. Do you see her more as like a nanny and caring and compassionate, or do you see her more as a program and is rigid and computerized um she's more rigid i mean again the the backstory there <clears throat> is that um this is a kind of an ancient piece of software this this was originally it was a kind of a customer service uh like a customer service chatbot that was supposed to to help back in the early days when when the family it was a family business but because they were scrimping and saving they kind of there were a lot of personality quirks in the software to start with, but his father never basically paid for the, the upgrade pattern. So mm -hmm. they've got this, the first version and over time, they've kind of like, she's developed her own tick. She, as an AI, she developed her own kind of like quirks and she sees herself as Derek has been kind of left and abandoned. Mm -hmm. She's almost assumed the, the mother role. So her role is more protective of Derek because he's mm -hmm. the last one left um yeah. she's kind of like the the embodiment of the ship and then okay. what she wants is she's mothering Derek but like every mother she, what she wants is a child to kind of grow up and take charge um and then about halfway through the story when he does that and he sets off to kind of after Maiden has been kidnapped and he he has to go off and on a rescue mission you know he's all of us things happen and he's like armed to the teeth and he's ready to go to save his friend you know i mean alice i think at some point keeps thinking there's going to be something romantic between the two of them and they don't want that but she mm -hmm. sees him as going off to rescue the woman he loves so Got she's it. all of a sudden becomes really proud of him and she's like yeah you go derek and he's all he's very encouraging rather mm -hmm. than being um rather than reprimanding him so she has this kind of she, the the ai has a growth arc as well excellent excellent okay so do you see this ai having feelings and emotions or is she utilizing the her programming to like he's not doing what he's supposed to according to my program so i'm going to reprimand him or is it more like you're making me mad because you're young and you're lazy and by this point you should be strong and brave yeah more she's definitely i think there there is an emotion aspect to her but obviously it's artificial yeah so okay she definitely kind of cares for him and wants what's best for him um but she can be a little bit overbearing okay so her voice is very human so like, let's take a look at this line between safety protocol or after safety protocol. Derek, I've had a worrying update from the astronaut system. A worrying update feels very human to me as opposed to computer, right? Like if you want it to be more of a computer standpoint, it would be Derek, the astronaut system provided an alert right? Like, instead of it's told me that you've just tried to plot a course, which is a very human way of talking, it would be the plotted course is through the middle of the Northogen space. The what are you thinking part could stay, right? If you wanted it to be more on the human side. So kind of thinking about, is this AI a person? Or is this AI a computer who has learned emotion over time and really thinking through how you want that to be? 
if you want it to be the latter, which is the AI who has become a person who has like feelings and emotions, then the language that you're using here is her speaking to him more as a person works. If you want us to really feel the fact that this is an AI system, and even though she's created this mothering feel to Derek, it Derek doesn't feel it as another person, which justifies his anger and his loneliness, then I would push more toward my programming tells me this and the, the computer part of it. I think there's definitely more a shift to the she's learned emotion uh, and there's a, there's a human element to it. So okay. um, th there's almost, I think there, there's, there's two elements. So things like where the repeated safety protocol alert, safety protocol alert, danger, danger, danger type of thing. Mm -hmm. That's almost um, like a computer alert that comes from the ship, whereas like an automated alert, whereas Alice's conversation is more human again you know shameless um rip off of you know any kind of british humor would see, would see this as kind of very atypical of red uh, the tv show red dwarf where you've got lister who is the atypical slacker who's been abandoned on a mining ship and held in stasis for three million years during and and alice is almost like holly the ship's computer who over that time of being alone has gone a little senile and is portrayed in the tv show by an old balding man in, in or the head the disembodied head initially of, a, of an old of an old man and they 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 definitely want to have banter between the two so part of the um again it's i think it's somewhere else later on in the story but there's um reference to the fact that one of the problems that people can experience of being on their own in deep space is mm -hmm. intense loneliness and going insane so the idea of having the ai is to kind of is to stop them from going insane is to kind of have keep them company so mm -hmm. that these delivery drivers are not going to effectively go off and walk out of an airlock because they've just gone insane by the vast loneliness of deep space mm -hmm. sure okay all right. So yeah, if you want her to be more on the humanistic side, then the direction that you're going works. Um, I would just say like, as you're going through, be mindful that her voice is consistent. If you push her in that direction, make sure she's consistent in that direction that she's speaking to him as like, the authority figure until you get to the place where her character arc changes and you're modulating her voice. Um, that, that works. Um, but just, you know, kind of be cautious of how, how she's speaking to him, that it really feels like a computerized nanny versus um, an AI system. In that instance, would it be better? Because obviously all of Alice's text is shown in italics to, to mm -hmm. differentiate her from Derek and or Maiden speaking, but would it be better to have like the safety protocol alert be kept as more of a robotic voice? This is just an alert that is triggered by this the computer uh, by the ship, and have Alice's voice actually being an actual character in quotes and not done in italics. So I like, personally, I really like the um, italics for Alice. It reminds us that she's a robotic alert, uh, a robotic voice. Um, what I would do in this instance is I would take the safety protocol alert and I would actually change this line. Because if she is the computer that like runs the ship and she is that like, it doesn't, it doesn't make sense to me to have two different systems on the ship, right? Like she is the ship. Um, I would actually change this to be Derek. We have a safety protocol alert. We must discuss. Yeah. In the first chapter, it, it kind of opens up with like, danger proximity alert and it's kind of repeated several times like it's a warning alert 
-hmm. and then uh derek's like oh god no not another alert look i've told you before this is just a standard pod coming you don't need to kind of like fire right. off being super overprotective every time you know and then that there's there's banter back and forth between them where mm -hmm. he's he's like a rebellious teenager trying to rebel against his mother who is because you know uh, if you can imagine a scenario where you've got a 20 year old guy out walking to the shops or you know he, he's out walking and every time he went to cross the road his mother's like look where you're going make sure you look left and right mm -hmm. you know and it is very kind of overbearing that's the kind of relationship they start off with mm -hmm. okay yeah um that that makes a lot of sense and if in the first chapter they have this huge banter about that then perhaps what this is is it starts with safety protocol alert. I mean, Derek, we must discuss the safety of the next mission, right? So like she starts it with the safety protocol alert, but then she quickly realizes that he doesn't like that. So she tries to change it, right? Yeah. So like I mean this, so she's so we're seeing that she's learning. I mean, in this instance here, that um, basically the course maiden has given him a course that where she wants to go. He he said um, she said we want to go to the Andor system. He thinks they want to go to one part of it and would go the normal safe route. She obviously wants to go. She's very explicit in the course she wants to go, which would mm -hmm. take them through a very dangerous part of space. And then all of a sudden, the, uh, Alice is jumping up and down saying, no, we can't go that way. It's dangerous. It's too dangerous. Mm -hmm. And then Maiden starts with the, here's money. I will give you more money. You know, like, mm -hmm. I'll double your fee. I'll triple your fee because she's so desperate to get there. So Derek right. eventually kind of like tries to stand up for himself and says, no, I'm the captain. We will go this way, you know, knowing full well that he's only doing it because he's been offered a load of money. Right. Which actually brings me to one more thing that I wanted to talk about in here. Um, she says, Maiden says, it's going to take too long. My question as the reader is, what's the hurry? So there's, there's an element in here that I am going to recommend that as you do an edit, you come in here and you, to me, it feels like, Derek is kind of put between a rock and a hard place. He wants to do a good job because he sees himself as like a captain, even though he's kind of just a boy playing captain. And the computer who is has all this information and knows that it's dangerous. So like in order for him to make this informed decision, there might need to be more information. The other place in the story, just before we wrap up, um, where I left you a note, uh, was about the fact that her grandfather was dead and his re remains are secured in the cargo hold. Um, I put a note in the margin about emotion. Um, to me, it feels like somebody is saying that there is a dead body on board Either she should have some emotion surrounding the fact that she's carting her dead grandfather around, or he should have a question about carting around the remains of this man, right? So like kind of thinking it, it felt very unresolved to me because here um, Derek is saying that you mentioned your grandfather, do we need to pick him up somewhere? And she's just like, no, he's dead. He's in the cargo hold, which based off of the background story that you have created for her about they like live in this colony and there is no privacy. It, it feels like for her, death is just a natural part of the colonization. But for him and for us as the reader, 
you tell me somebody is dead, I expect to have some sort of emotional response to that. So that would be the other place through the story where I would recommend that you spend a little bit of time thinking about what you want your reader to feel there. Okay. I mean, I can see Derek would have more of a, um, a reaction, as you say, Maiden, it's very matter of fact. And there is there's a plot twist, there isn't actually a body in there at all. So there's just the casket and the, it's carrying contraband, but she's using the cover of her, you know, like smuggling stuff in a coffin type of approach. Right, which actually makes more sense as to why she has no emotional reaction to it, but he's having an emotional reaction to it. Yeah, so Derek so, thinks there's a body there, but there isn't actually one. Yeah, so I would say spend a little bit of time there. Um, you have him being very, and I actually missed this quote in here. Um, so it didn't get color coded there. Every time I go, I change the text color instead of the background color every time. Yeah. So it, he gets very formal here. I would say perhaps instead of being really formal, he like has more of an, a reaction to it. Um, this feels more like um, her, one of her lines in the formality of it than one of his lines. He, he seems to like respond very emotionally to things, which makes sense because he's kind of alone on a ship and the only person he has to talk to is AI. So he can kind of be whatever he's going to be. So that would be the other part where I would recommend you spend a little bit of time. <laughs> yeah. I mean, at that point, this is I think this is Derek realizing, oh, this is there's a dead body. Oh, look, now we have to actually be serious. And he's this is he's actually trying to pay respect to her and, and be and be professional when he kind of straightens his jackets and and hopes that mm. you know last night's the dinner stains from last night's dinner aren't don't show too much. Yeah. Yeah, I can I can see that. Um I suppose, it, it, again, it would be finding a balance. It would almost be like, you know, um, again, it, it, it's caught him off guard. So he doesn't really know what to say. So like when the, um, in the similar version, in the similar way mm -hmm. to having to kind of admit that this is his bedroom and it's in a real mess, this co has caught him off guard a little bit um, mm -hmm. because he's not really got too much kind of, experience with this he doesn't really know how to act so there would be a kind of a stunted conversation where, where he's he's trying to do the right thing in terms of paying his respects and, and he's trying to be professional okay if that's the case then move this around so immediately after what she says he says so she says that his remains are in the cargo hold instead of him telling us about the oblong container. So by saying that he understands where the casket is, you've taken me out of the emotional moment. So pull me back into the emotional moment by starting off immediately with my condolences for your loss. She can then respond with something that's actually, you know what? Let's do one of these things where, no, my grandfather is dead. My condolences for your loss. She responds with his remains are in the cargo hold. I straighten my jacket can come up with my condolences for your loss, right? Like, so then it's him, that's showing him, like you're saying, he's trying to like be professional for her, not really knowing how to handle the emotional part of it. Um, so maybe he needs to respond emotionally to her one more time. Um, so he, she says his remains are in the cargo hold. Maybe you can then leave the, the oblong container as part of her line, even though it's his. And then maybe he says something again, something along the lines of, and I'm just gonna fill it in. You'll put his actual voice in here later, but 
um, still the loss must be so sad. Something where he's responding emotionally and then she comes back and says whatever she says about part of life in her formal way, because she knows he's not actually there. Maybe he's not even actually dead. And then he wraps up with the com the best company spiel. And then he, he moves on. For me as the reader, this feels more like a realistic emotional connection about death. But then it makes more sense later when we find out that it's not her grandfather in the casket, it's actually smuggled materials. Then we go back to that original scene and we're like, oh, now we understand why she didn't care that her grandfather was in the hold, right? So. Yeah, I mean, there are there are a lot, there's a couple of other reasons as well, because, you know, it, it turns out he's not a very nice person and he double crossed everybody. So um, we don't want to go too far, too many spoilers. <laughs> right. <laughs> Yeah. Well, this was a lot of fun. Thank you so much. Was there anything else you wanted to ask before we wrap up? No, no, that's fine. That, that's lovely. I, and it's been really informative. You know, um, I actually thought I was going to be a bit cheeky because obviously Jeff had, uh, I got Jeff to look at the first chapter and, mm -hmm. then, and again, adding this one through. So I've got the first two chapters uh, edited uh, and it's been really informative and I can see you know, everything you're saying makes perfect sense and trying to create this back and forth and create this banter and the, the um, show their characters through their kind of how how they converse with one another. It's been really useful. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah, yeah. Um, and, you know, that's one of the great things about the Slack channel um, that we have out there um, is that we do have this ability to post work for people to read um, and get feedback on in that Slack channel. So we're really glad to have you there. Um, and for anyone who's listening, who wants to get into the Slack channel and be a part of it, um, all you have to do is go um, and sign up at uh, Patreon, Jeff Elkins. Um, and it's just a couple dollars a month or a week. I don't even, I don't even know what the pricing structure is. Jeff's in charge of all the all the important stuff. I just get to read um, and get to comment on people's writing. So, um, but yeah, we definitely would love to continue growing the community. There's lots of value over there. So, John, thanks so much for letting me read your piece and get to know your characters. I'm really excited to see the next chapters. Thank you very much. I'll be sure to post it in the Slack channel. Sounds good. I'm going to go ahead and stop the recording now.